to share the slides to me? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. okay. Let me wait. I stop sharing. Okay, it works. So give me a second. Let me take a glass of water. So, oh, sure. Still like have five minutes. So just yeah. take your time. Mm -hmm. Just I, I get that and I come back. Sure, thank you. back okay great so how's the vaccination <laughs> oh the second the second one uh, the second one i was quite down for uh, like two days mm -hmm. but um but now it's done oh okay so you're finally able to sleep at night then yeah mm. yeah now it's done and uh and yeah, I I need that because uh, mm -hmm. if I if I plan to travel or anything, now they are asking for the vaccination. Mm, okay. So, so was it Pfizer or Moderna? Pfizer. Pfizer. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what? I think the effect is similar to my father because my father also get sleep at night as well <laughs> that's right yeah it was like i i i got it and it was like oof, very it was almost one day in in, in bed uh, but then the next day was okay i mean after one and a half two days was okay mm. okay so good to know that you feel better yeah yeah no, now now it's fine now it's fine but how's the situation in uh, right there because i've heard it i've heard from the news that uh, europe is currently in another lockdown but what about in uk no nothing at the moment mm. nothing at the moment but uh yes i don't know germany no austria i think it was austria Mm -hmm. uh, going to went to lockdown. Germany is also probably going, but I really hope that we don't. Mm -hmm. I really, really hope we don't. And um, and yeah, that is let's see because you know mm -hmm. it can change at any time. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, are you planning to travel home uh, during Christmas? It's very difficult to, mm. to say because um, flights are very, very expensive. Ah, I see. More expensive than ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then there are a lot of restrictions. So I don't, I don't know. Mm. If they put a lockdown, then I cannot come back. Mm, I see. That's yeah. the problem. So I, I, I'm still deciding. Okay. 
So I guess like it's already 4 p.m. or 9 a.m. at UK time. So I think it's better to start right now. Should I um should I share from now? Yes, I guess. Okay. 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 So uh uh good afternoon uh everyone. Uh welcome to the guest lecture with uh, Dr. Claudia Aravena from Harriet Watt University, Edinburgh, United Kingdom. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, okay, so we are in the fifth guest lecture series uh, held by Department of Economics, Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta. Uh, now uh, the guest lecture series will discuss about uh, one particular topic in environmental economics. So it is market goods versus non-market goods. Okay, so I think without any further ado, uh, Dr. Paudia, uh, the time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Romy. And thank you very much for the invitation to this, uh, uh, to give this lecture. Hello, everybody. Well, um, I'm going to be talking today uh, about market and not market goods and uh, basically uh, the role of them or how we approach them for uh, environmental evaluation. Please feel free if you have any question uh, to post the question or interrupt me. Uh, that's totally OK at any time. So yeah, uh, I, I am uh, an environmental and energy economist, just for those who, who don't know me. And uh, my one, one of my main areas of expertise is actually environmental evaluation. So let's start uh, with this. I'm gonna do today, uh, first starting with basic definitions, which all of you would be very familiar with. It's very basic about markets, what are market goods and non-market goods. Then we will go through the challenges of non-market goods. Uh, and we will take the view of market failures, so specifically externalities and environmental values. I will uh, talk about the type of values and environment evaluation techniques, putting a bit of more focus on state of preference and methodologies. Uh, and if we have time, I plan to uh, show some examples on how to use the values of, uh, of uh, non-market evaluations or market valuations in cost benefit analysis and policy recommendations. Okay, so uh, first of all, we are talking about markets here. What is a market? Uh, excuse uh, me, Claudia, sorry for interrupting, uh, but your slides are not visible from my screen. No? Okay, uh, let me share again. Let me stop sharing and share again. Uh, share guest lecture. Can you see? Still not yet. Oh, mm. it says that that is sharing here. Mm. Okay, let me pause sharing, stop sharing. Screen share. Mm, that's, that's strange. And now, uh, not yet. I don't know. I think. Okay. Um, okay, uh, Romy. I don't know because it says it. It is all the other people. Can anyone see the, or no one can see the slides? But the kelihatan nggak di layar slide-nya? 
Tidak, Pak. No, no the answer. No. Tidak. No. You said no. Okay, that's that's really strange. Uh, uh, Romy, let me do something. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, let me do something. Let me uh, reconnect. And if not, I'm sending you that and you can put sure. share because that's very strange. Give me one second. Mm Ah, now it's visible. Now can you see that? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, good. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry, everyone. I don't know what happened with that. So let me continue then. Well, okay. Okay, so I was uh, talking, okay, we are talking here about markets. So what markets are, are the place where a uh, buyers and seller can gather to facilitate the change of goods and services. So that's the completely basic um, concept. So we have that the market gets uh, the equilibrium where the demands meet the uh, supply uh, in this graph. So in this point with Q1 and P1 as a quantity and price of equilibrium. So what uh, we have in uh, here, first thing, the first element of the market is the price. So which is this P1. So when we talk about price, we talk about the value of a good or service. So there is a market value for that. Another, on another uh, side, the second element are goods and services, which is what we have in the X axis. Okay, this green one. And goods and services could be anything from apples, cars, computers, uh, medical uh, service, uh, etc. So, and anything, but we can also have uh, as goods and services, um, the biodiversity, a uh, clean air, the, the, uh, forest, for example, or rainforest in this case of this picture, and other uh, things that, for example, are comfort, that are more abstract. Those are also considered as um, goods and services. So market goods are those who can be sold in a market at a certain price. So there exists a market for those uh, goods. We have a price for those goods that is uh, established in that market. So the cars, the uh, services, health services, or the um, houses. So that we have, 
we have then uh, the market goods. Non-market goods are those in which we cannot trade those goods in the market. And therefore there is not a price, there is no price for those goods. For example, the clean air, what is the price of the clean air? What is the price of biodiversity? What uh, is uh, the price of the landscape? So there is no, uh, no market for landscape, for example. So it's very difficult to establish a price for uh, that. And that those are the type of non-market goods. What are the challenges of these types of uh, goods? The challenges is uh, how to measure uh, these goods and more importantly, how to value uh, these goods. How do you value the uh, clean air? How you value the uh, clean water, for example? What is the value of a friendship? So that is a, what we want to have a look today. So how we get values for market and non-market goods. And for markets, as I said, it's very easy. There, there is a market and we will have a price, but the complicated part are the non-market goods. So in order to start understanding it, let's, um, take the case of externalities. Externalities, as uh, many of you would know, uh, are uh, the external effects of uh, activities either from a consumer or a producer that has an impact on a third party. It could be positive or negative, okay? So let's uh, think about uh, externalities in energy. Let's talk about the market good of energy. Energy is a market good. We have prices for energy. We pay uh, our bills. So we have the demand and supply, and we have uh, the quantity of uh, energy we demand a certain price. However, Let's now think about generation of energy. Let's think about energy generated by fossil fuels, specifically oil, coal, and gas. So, so if we just think in the generation of that good, it has a financial, uh, a financial cost. If we just take into account that cost, we will be in a graph like this with a demand for um, electricity, let's call energy, uh, elect sorry, oops, back, back. Uh, a demand of, uh, of electricity or energy coming from fossil fuels and the generation that provides the supply. So the market would uh, meet and in Q1 and P1. So with this amount of energy producer, uh, a P1 at that price. However, the energy generated by fossil fuels produces air pollution and other consequences uh, like landscape intrusion. Uh, so those are, those are certain externalities, in this case, negative externalities that are not incorporated into the uh, this this uh, graph. So, so what we have here is a, just a private uh, market. So we have a market failure with these externalities, which are, are which come from the air pollution produced with a health impact, etc. So we have then our MC supply curve, which is the same than the one before, and the demand curve. So we have Q1 and P1 again as uh, the, the equilibrium. But now we have an external cost, which is the, this 
uh, pollution and the health impacts. So let's call it the marginal environmental cost that you see in this curve here. So that uh, the more we produce of energy, the larger is the air pollution and the other consequences or externalities. So what we have to do is to our um, uh, normal curve of supply, we have to add uh, this cost to bring and calculate the marginal social cost. So this is a private cost then shift to this uh, MSC curve. So now the, we can see that there is an inefficiency in the market. The private costs differ from the social cost. The market's inefficient is producing too much at Q1 while it should be producing Q star. And uh, the price should be P star higher than the P1 that is the price. So that produces a social uh, cost, a dead weight loss for welfare. This is the same uh, graph uh, than before. So we want to see the source of e economic inefficiency in this. And this is the social costly uh, production, which is the incorrect pricing uh, we have. So the uh, the price uh, we had before is too low. It is too low and it, it reflects the marginal private cost, but not the marginal social cost. Only at a higher uh, cost, the price level uh, would be only at that price, higher price, uh, it's efficient that, to be, that the good will be produced. So we, we have a QS. So how to correct these previous externalities is a, que is a question. Internalizing an externality involves altering the incentive so that people take account of the external effects of their actions. So we need to alter those incentives. And for that, we need policy instruments. In that case, you probably have seen in your uh, microeconomic uh, lectures that the, the way we can internalize this or the government can internalize an externality by imposing a tax on the producer. So the energy uh, generator, uh, we, pro we, we impose a task to reduce the equilibrium. So the tax is this, this uh, uh, this line, purple line that is here. Now, the important thing and the key thing here to bring the uh, market to an equilibrium and the social optimum is that this tax has to be set in the right uh, amount, okay? This cannot um, uh, be larger, if it is larger, we will be producing even less. If it is uh, smaller, we will be producing between P, QP and QS. So it has to be that amount. If we think I'm not gonna go into these formulas, it's just to, to show you uh, how this is supported um, from the economic model. If we go to the um, models, of a policy instrument, what is the size of the tax we get? So if we uh, maximize the welfare, which is price multiply quantity minus the cost, okay? Minus the damage uh, we get from, or the externality, the negative externalities, uh, the first order of the condition will say that the marginal cost equal to the marginal damage or the price equals the cost plus the damage. If we do that for the uh, film now, we have that the benefit is the price multiply quantity minus the cost minus we impose this tax. 
multiplied by the number of E emissions, okay? So air pollution. So we want to see this tax, what the size uh, of the tax we need to, uh, to get the ops, uh, social optimum. We solve the uh, first order conditions and uh, um, then you have that the price is the uh, marginal cost plus T tax multiplied the marginal emissions, or we can say that the marginal cost equals the, uh, the same pattern. So the conditions, if you see, uh, for a quantity or for abatement in this case are exactly the same. The only difference is uh, instead of uh, T, in this part we have T, which means that the conditions uh, for, for uh, an optimum tax is that the tax should be the same size than the damage or the externality. Okay, so we know the externality that if we don't consider the, uh, the externalities, we will be into a market inefficiency. So the market uh, good will have the wrong uh, price. So we need to introduce the non-market uh, good um, price, which is the price of this externality. And from this, we know that they, in order to get the right uh, place uh, in, the, in the efficiency, the, the tax has to be equal to the damage. But now we got, get the problem. Is this easy to do? And the answer of uh, this is uh, no, this is not actually easy because it's difficult to estimate the damage of uh, created by this type of energy generation because many goods have no markets. They are non-market goods. So the air, the quality of air is a non-market good. And uh, so how we deal with that, what the solution would be. So for that, we then have environmental valuation. So how to evaluate uh, the externalities in monetary terms is the question, because we need to know the, uh, the value of those externalities in order to set the right tax. So how to measure the values and cost of non-market environmental services is a question. For, him, for example, the environmental degradation, the clean air. So the first approach we should take in this is a market value. So let's see if we can get uh, values of these externalities from the market. So we have air pollution in here. So think about how can you approximate the value of air pollution? So uh, one way we can do that is uh, thinking about the cost of hospitalization and the treatment. So basically in the area where we have the um, the fossil fuel energy generation, we can uh, see how many visits to doctors people from the area have, what is the cost of those visits, and what is the cost of the treatment of people who have respiratory um, uh, illnesses. So, so then, okay, we are using a market technique, we are using the market to value a non-market good. And that's right. Another way that we can value, for example, the air pollution or the quality of uh, the air uh, is through changes in the property value. 
So if we have a, a, a thermoelectric plant, so how much were the prices of the houses in that area before the installation of uh, the thermoelectric plant and after that? And the difference will give you an approximation of the uh, value of that externality. But market uh, does not always provide a direct information regarding the value society plays on changes in the provision of environmental goods and services. So that's why when we don't have this market providing this information, we need uh, to uh, rely on environmental valuation techniques. So when we talk about environmental valuation, what do we value? So we value improved environmental quality impacts of energy uh, uh, development, for example. We value uh, recreational opportunities given by national parks, ecosystem conservation, for example, uh, the value of exotic species, endangered species. Uh, one of the works I have done, for example, is uh, the value of um, um, megafauna, marine, megafauna, uh, sharks, um, giant uh, tortoises, and, uh, and those type of endangered species. Um, and then also we can uh, value government provided goods and services. Okay, so Before I continue, is there any question until here? Is that clear? The differentiation between market, non-market goods and how we value them? If there is any question, just let me know. So, okay. So what are the motivations to do environmental valuation? The principal motivation of this is to enable environmental impacts to be included in cost benefit analysis. So what we can do as a, what you I showed you before is try to calculate the social uh, cost of project, for example. We had the private cost, but we want the social cost in order to get uh, the market uh, to work in an efficient uh, way and put in place the policy instruments uh, that are necessary. So we want environmental valuation or the value of this non-market goods to design policy instruments as well, to design compensation schemes, to design policy instruments, for example, the tax I was talking to the, um, the generator of energy from fossil fuels. So with that, we can calculate the value of that tax or the compensation that people who live around a wind farm uh, a needs, how much they should be compensated for the damage uh, or the disturbance they get. Also, environmental valuation um, is important in the introduction of environmental values in the national accounting, which is something that people talk a lot. Should we include the natural capital in our GDP, for example. So, and if we include that, how, what is the value of that? So environmental evaluation can inform in that uh, sense. And uh, finally, to derive an appropriate monetary value measure 
of changes in the quantity and the quality of environmental goods, or the change of the inutility associated to damages and benefit from projects. So what is the measure of those externalities, the benefits or the damage that uh, we have uh, from different projects? For example, I, uh, when I was studying uh, the evaluation of tortoises, um, we studied uh, the evaluation through the damage uh, they had from uh, tourists, the, in, the increase in tourists in uh, the Galapagos Island. So the increase in tourists have impacted biodiversity and we value that uh, biodiversity and this is um, why, how we use evaluation. Okay, so now we know the need of evaluation. But before going through the techniques of environmental evaluation, we need to be clear about what are the different types of values. So we have three types of value we need to bear in mind. First is the use values, uh, which can be consumptive uh, use or non-consumptive use. Consumptive use is uh, the value we get from using a uh, good or services. For example, what is the value I get uh, to to use to use a, a national park for hiking? For example, what is the value I uh, get uh, from using if we think about about uh, market goods what is the value you get from eating a certain uh, a, a certain fruit for example so in terms of non market okay what value i get from from a uh, looking at nice landscape where i live that is the use value the non consumptive use is the one that uh, that uh, is related to recreation, a bit of uh, the, the value that going fishing will give to you, for example. So these two values is because we use, we are in contact with the uh, good or service. But we have also non-use values. For the non-use values is when there is no interaction between us and the good. And these, uh, these values are characterized or um, there are three types of values in here, the existent or intrinsic value, the altruistic value and bequest value. So the existing value is, for example, you may not be in touch with uh, whales for it but you may be willing to pay to, uh, for conservation of whales because they have a value for you. Just the, the fact that they exist uh, has a value for you. That's existing, existing value. Altruistic value is uh, goods may have a value for you uh, just because they can be um, they can be good for other people. So the fact that they are good for other people may make you feel uh, good and you will give a value to that. And the bequest value, this is something I find a lot when I do the surveys. Is uh, when, for, exa for example, when I ask uh, people what is the willingness to pay, for um, the reduction in emissions. And they, uh, they say something because they say like, or, or not the reduction of emission for the conservation, let's say for the conservation of a certain species that because it's not news value that we have no contact with. And they say like they are willing to pay because they want their future generations to enjoy that and to get to know that. So it's a bequest value. So this, uh, we have the use value and non-use values, and we need to uh, identify them. 
And finally, we have the option values. The option values are uh, the value that you give to a good or service because you have the option to enjoy that uh, at some point. For example, if I take the whales, uh, that you have an existing value because, but probably it's an, an option value because you, you have uh, in mind that probably you have the opportunity to go and see uh, the whales in, at some point. So that is uh, the uh, option value. Is that clear to everyone? If there is any question, again, just feel free to uh, ask, please. Okay, so let's uh, move. If there are no questions, I don't see anything in the chat. Okay, let's move to um, the different approaches we have for a, a value environmental goods. So we have two types of approaches in here. Uh, one is the reveal preferences, and the second is the stated preferences. So the reveal preferences uh, techniques, they estimate only use values. Uh, these techniques are based on observed behavior and they are a direct method of valuation because they ask uh, directly to people what they have uh, spent or what is the impact of, uh, of an externality had, for example, on a market good. So uh, in this uh, case, in the reveal preferences, we have two techniques, the travel cost and the hedonic prices. They are the two main techniques. On the other hand, we have a stated preference methodologies. They estimate not only the use value, but also non-use values. And that's why I wanted you to be clear about what the different types of value are. These stated preferences are based in surveys, data, questionnaires, and is an indirect method because what is asked to people are the willingness to pay or the willingness to accept uh, for certain uh, goods or as a compensation of uh, a certain uh, disruption, for example. So the main techniques uh, in stated preferences are continuing valuation and choice experiments. So these are the two uh, types then of, um, of approaches. So reveal preferences, only uh, use values and direct methods, while state preferences is um, non-use values and indirect method asking willingness to pay. The other is based on behavior and this uh, stated preference in surveys, okay? So I hope you get the difference between the two of them. And my idea is, um, of course, I could give a full course of uh, these techniques, and um, but we have just this hour uh, and a half to, to, so I'm gonna give just the basics of uh, each of these methods. And with a bit more focus on state of preference methods. Um, so let's start with travel costs. The travel cost is basically what, what it means, the cost of travel, but uh, it's mainly applied to determine the values of sites used for recreation. For example, uh, the value of, of national parks. Um, so the, this method collects data on the cost that individuals incur where they travel to this sites or to this uh, recreational uh, site. So what are the costs that a person uh, had to go to uh, visit a national park, for example? 
And that means the time, the, the cost of the time and the travel cost expenses that are incurred by people visiting the site. And that is the price or the value they will give to that national park. So we cannot give a market value, there is no market value, but then we can use a travel cost method to, uh, to infer this uh, value in this way. So the willingness to pay to visit the site can be estimated based on the number of trips uh, people uh, do at different travel costs. If it is cheap to go to the place, you probably will go several times. If it is very expensive, you probably will go uh, just once, twice. So it's very similar uh, to the willingness to pay for market goods because you are actually paying for that. You are actually doing that. For example, um, this is generally uh, done in the entrance of national parks. So the researcher asks people who go there, okay, how, uh, how long it took you to come here? So to have an idea of the, uh, the uh, cost of the time. Then and they will ask, how much did you spend in petrol, in food, in hotel, okay? In any other expense there that to go in there, uh, probably toll fees. And then you can add those values and you get the uh, potential valuation of uh, the good. What are the advantages of this uh, method? Is that the method is based on actual behavior instead of hypothetical behavior, which is the willingness to pay that we have in, in um, stated preference. This is actual behavior and is inexpensive to apply. Also, it, will, it would allow, allow for larger samples it allows for larger samples because people in general, when it is, you know, a survey on site, get more involved and get more interested. So it's, it's more likely you get a larger sample and it's easy to interpret once you do the uh, analysis. But it also has some limitations. Uh, and these limitations are that assumes that people perceive and respond the changes to changes in travel costs in the same way that changes in admission prices. And this can be different. The, uh, the way people um, really perceive the changes in the admission of a park can be completely different to uh, changes in the uh, cost of travel. Another very important uh, limitation is that it assumes that uh, people, this is for a single purpose trip and not for multiple purpose. So if you are going, for example, to a beach or a um, national park, but this is part of a visit of several places, Okay, so for example, you go to a national park, but in between you have a beach, so you go to the beach, you enjoy the beach, then you go to the national park. You have a multi-purpose uh, trip. So the value you will get of that is, uh, is, is not uh, really very accurate. It could overestimate the value of the good. So we cannot measure uh, option uh, by, uh, that, so in, that is one thing. And the final limitation is that we cannot measure the option values with the co travel cost because it's real, is what we have there. Okay, the second uh, methodology for uh, revealed preferences are the hedonic prices. The hedonic prices estimate the economic value of non-market goods and services that are directly affect, uh, that directly affect market prices. So the basic for me is of this is that the price of a marketed good is related to the characteristics or the services that is produced. 
Generally, we want to estimate uh, the values of environmental quality. For example, the air or water pollution or the, the value of environmental amenities. For example, the aesthetic views. Let's put some examples in here. Um, we can do with hedonic prices what I was telling you before, the, um, how we value the air pollution through the one way uh, it would be through the price of uh, property, the property uh, value. So when areas that have more air pollution, the property values we expect to be lower than area, the same area without air pollution. So if you calculate the difference between these prices, then you have the value of uh, that externality, for example. Let's think on renewable energy, for example, and the installation of wind farms. And then we have environmental amenities in this. So, um, so how much the value of the land in an area increases or reduces because we have a wind farm that will give you the value of that environmental amenity, okay? So that difference in price. So those are some of the examples of how we uh, use hedonic uh, price methodology, which uh, as well ha has so, uh, some advantages that it estimates the value on actual choices. So it's a to an actual measure. And also some data like what I was talking to you, the property price are generally very reliable. They are data that you are sure that they are uh, good. Also, uh, this method allows the interaction between market and non-market goods. So we are interacting the price of a market good property with non-market good air quality. Okay, so that's uh, those are some advantages of uh, the hedonic uh, price. Of course, it also has some limitations. This uh, methodology, and one of them is that it needs a large amount of data in order to be able to estimate uh, econometrically uh, this. And given that it needs large amount of data, it basically depends on the availability of that data. Uh, in many cases, they might not be easily available. Uh, housing prices, for example, or, or land prices. So, and the results we get depend on the model F specification because we use high uh, statistical and econometric analysis for this. So of course, uh, sometimes uh, the results may not be completely robust and we, we might have a different uh, end results. And uh, another limitation of uh, hedonic prices is it has a limited scope. For example, is a, a lot focusing on housing uh, prices. Uh, but it doesn't go uh, too much beyond that. So, so yes, so those are the limitations that we get from hedonic price. Before I jump to stated preference methodologies, any question? Uh, Claudia, uh, I've just... I've just retrieved a direct message from one of the participants. So the participants actually is too shy to ask. So he asked uh, through me. Uh, yes. So uh, the participant asked uh, whether uh, the participants asked about uh, the central problem uh, happening in the context of travel cost method, like. Is there any way to anticipate uh, uh, in all, uh, 
Is there any way to anticipate uh, such uh, central problem? What do you mean with central problem? If you can. Okay, like, uh, I'm not sure actually because the student asked me in Persa and I'm trying to translate this in English. So, so he asked. If, if you want, just ask, just ask in your language and okay. uh, yes. And so then you can translate. Okay, so he asked about uh, the central issue in the context of using travel cost method. Okay, like, so it, basically what is the, let me see. Uh, in the travel cost. Method, yes. Okay, so uh, the question is, uh, what is the, the, the crucial issue while using travel cost paper. Okay, the, the, the crucial issue in terms of the crucial uh, problem. Yes. Yeah, okay. The, the main problem in uh, with a um, uh, travel cost method would be that we are missing uh, the option values. So it's a bit limited in there, in that, because we only will have the use value of uh, the good or service. And also that uh, use value is a limit as well, because if you have one trip, for example, that is not just to the place, but it, you go to other places, then the cost increase, but the cost didn't increase because you are going to that place. The cost increased because you went to another place. So it may be overestimating the value of the site. So uh, that, that, is, uh, that is one, I mean, the main issue, the, main, the two main issues, I would say. Uh, one is we don't have the uh, option values and then uh, the overestimation that we have uh, with that. Would that answer is the question? I think so, but has I think so, but uh, is there any way to anticipate uh, the limitation? Yes, yes, of course there is. So ways uh, to not probably anticipate, but deal with uh, that would be uh, well with a non-use value, no. With this methodology, unless you you incorporate uh, together with the travel cost another methodology, a stated preference methodology, then you you can integrate both, and you will have uh, that use and non-use value. On um, on the other hand, uh, when you apply the cost uh, travel the travel cost method, you can ask the people who uh, you are asking for the cop for the expenses, if they did any other trip. And if the person can tell you really what the costs uh, are related to this other trip, how many kilometers, for example, were there, if he pay an extra night of hotel to go to that, that other place. And then you can subtract that from from uh, your final uh, travel cost. And in that case, you are disentangled the, um, the, this, this, uh, this double valuation. Mm -hmm. Does that help? I think so. If it is not clear, uh, please tell that. Just keep asking. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm happy. I'm happy to to go more into sure. that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, any other questions? Please, if you have, just feel free to ask. So. Uh, in the meantime, then I, I go to a state of preference methodologies. 
Let's start with the contingent valuation method. The contingent valuation you probably have heard uh, is the most common method to derive non-use values for market goods. And uh, the contingent valuation is a survey-based technique where we ask people the willingness to pay or the willingness to accept for environmental non-market goods. So some examples of, um, of the applications of the continuum valuation method are the benefits, uh, the value, calculating the value of benefit of outdoor recreation, the improvements in air or water quality, the benefit of the wilderness areas, benefit of reducing transport uh, risks, for example, and uh, we have many, many others uh, in this. So I would like to just tell you a bit of what are the steps of uh, conducting a continuum valuation study, which in terms of design, it is uh, it takes much, much longer than a revealed preference uh, study. Um, so to conduct um, or to design a continuum valuation uh, study, the first thing you have to do is conduct focus group with the general public, expert, policy makers, uh, industry people. Uh, in general, when I work in, uh, in energy, I conduct focus group with engineers, biologists, uh, economists, uh, the households, etc., and policymakers always. Then from that focus group and having clear what is the good that is value, we design a questionnaire. We design a questionnaire. Um, I'm not gonna go in, into the structure and the different types of questionnaire because of the time, but uh, that's the generic part. Then uh, we choose an appropriate survey technique. Are you gonna ask, uh, uh, apply your survey face-to-face, -face, by mail, by email or a, a web, um, by telephone? And it all depends where you apply uh, your, your, your uh, evaluation. And for that, you need to identify the relevant population or the sample strategy. Are there, for example, random random uh, selection of houses are uh, there um, uh, people over certain age or just women or just men so uh, identify the relevant population and conduct a, stu a pilot study the pilot studies are when you test your survey before going to the field you go and to some of a uh, of the people of your sample, and you see if your questionnaire is working, if your evaluation uh, question is understood, not only the evaluation question, but all the questions. Uh, and so you analyze the responses and the results from those uh, studies, the, from those pilot studies. And there are always things that don't work. So you change them, and then you go again, uh, and conduct more pilots until you see that your um, your survey really it works. Once you see that it is ready for implementation, then you go to the field for the data collection. And after that, then you just do the data analysis and uh, look for the policy advice. So we have a se several steps before we actually go to the uh, to collect the data. So it takes time and uh, and believe me the design of a questionnaire for evaluation uh, study a state of preference either continue evaluation or choice experiment takes long long time uh, don't think that you will do that in a month or two months in general it takes to me six months to get something completely uh, well so uh, in a particular, um, the continuum evaluation is used for environmental goods and more uh, generally for public goods. 
in here we ask willingness to pay to people when we ask when we use continuing valuation generally it is through a referendum question so we ask uh, binary uh, questions in which they ask the answer yes or no for example the typical question for a, a continuing valuation would be if a policy a delivering a positive change b what the change is was in an agenda and it cost x amount would you vote for this agenda yes or no so this is what is called a referendum method and is thought to be potentially incentive compatible so basically it puts in place a truth revealing mechanism uh, to get to to get the best uh, or the more accurate uh, or truthfully um, answer from respondents. Generally, we have a, what we use are split samples. So a sub sample, you can call it a sub samples. A, we design a prices to ask people, are you willing to pay when we ask in this referendum? And we have to tell them a certain amount. So that is designed in a, a, a statistical a way. And uh, we present different values to different uh, subsamples. So the proportion of yes is mod modeled in a statistical way. Typically, we uh, use a parametric setup that produce the curve that we observe, like a demand curve, and the non-parametric uh, setup produce a monotonic not increasing step function. So basically the distribution of it. Two ways uh, in which uh, we ask values in continuing evaluation. One is open-ended. Basically you go and ask people, how much are you willing to pay? For a certain environmental change, $10, $20, $5. So it's open to the people to say. Another way is the close ended uh, in which we have single bounded dichotomous choice, double bounded dichotomous choice, or multiple bounded. I'm going to go back to this in a second. Close ended is the referendum. So you present the person a, a, a bit or a value. Are you willing to pay this amount? And they say yes or no. There are other ways which are the um, uh, cards in which they put with intervals and they just choose one interval they will be willing to pay. Okay, what is this referendum single bound? So you ask the person, are you willing to pay, um, let's say, let's call it five US dollar to generate uh, the, um, the electricity with renewables and avoid the uh, externalities of fossil fuels? The person say yes or no, and that is. Then uh, we could also use a double bounded referendum, which is based that after the single bound, if the person say yes, we increase the value. Okay, are you willing to pay five? Yes. And, and would you be willing to pay 10? Yes or no? If the person say no, then we reduce the value. So would you be willing to pay 2.5? Yes or no? So we generate uh, these four uh, types of responses that reduces a lot the variance because if we have just one response we have a huge variance in in the willingness to pay so in this case we reduce uh, the variance however it has also um, some of some limitations i'm not gonna go through that because of the time but uh, just to make you aware the continuing valuation method method is based on the random utility model where the uh, where the utility of the individual uh, it has a part that is observed which is price quantity and income 
and another part that is not observed or is stochastic. So we will have two situations here. The uh, Q0 is a current uh, situation or a status quo, and the Q1 is the new situation in which we have the same uh, utility function, but we reduce the income by certain bit or price, which is basically the willingness to pay. So uh, as I said, the, the utility function is formed, but the uh, deterministic part, which is all what the researcher observes, and the stochastic term, which is the non-observable uh, term. And because we have the, this stochastic term, then we rely on probabilities. So we give to uh, a scenario to the individual in which we present the change uh, bet between the status quo and the new quality of uh, the good. And in the scenario, the individual is asked if he or she would be willing to pay a certain cost. And so the way you model it is with probabilities. Uh, I'm not gonna go through this, uh, but uh, it's just to let you know that then we assume generally linear, um, more linear um, specifications, and then we can write in this way uh, the, um, the probabilities and what we estimate is this cumulative distribution function. Uh, but the main purpose of this analysis is basically to estimate willingness to pay. From uh, so we have uh, basically this is the the um, the current situation and this would be the uh, the new situation the number one. So if you solve this uh, equation for the bid bid is willingness to pay, you will get this answer. So basically, your uh, willingness to pay is based on the parameters of, um, of your model divided by the parameter mu, the parameter of the income, or the parameter of the price. OK, so with that, you will get a willingness to pay. We will see uh, in a bit how to use this willingness to pay. And that willingness to pay is the value people give to the non-market good, or the value people give to environmental uh, degradation, for example, or the conservation of, of uh, a species or environmental services. So uh, this method, however, has some anomalies. I'm going to only mention the anomalies in here um, because of time, but you can ask later on if, if you want, or I can direct you where you can find more information on this. So some of the anomalies are uh, the willingness to pay, willingness to accept disparity, because we know that uh, there are differences between willingness to pay and willingness to accept that could be even seven times uh, different. The endowment effect. Uh, when we talk about the double bounded, there are anomalies like the internal consistency. When you calculate the value of a good using only single bound, generally is different to the value you calculate when it's double bounded. Uh, then anchoring effects, because when you ask twice, people may anchor their responses to the first bit you ask. Embedding effect, uh, we have found that many times if you ask, for example, the value of one species, that is sometimes uh, the same that if you value a, a group of species. So those uh, are some of the anomalies. This anomaly, uh, there are ways to deal with them and actually to improve uh, them, so to overcome them. And we have been studying that for a long time. 
there are a lot of biases you can have in continuing evaluation studies as well. And, uh, and uh, here I have made a list of them. I'm not gonna go, but I'm gonna just mention so you are aware they exist. So we have the hypothetical nature of the uh, exercise, because this is not a um, live or, uh, one with the other, like the reveal preferences. This is all hypothetical. The insensitivity to scope, warm glow, uh, the interviewer bias. Uh, also we have a prominence bias when something is uh, more important taken by people. A temporal embedding strategic bias. Uh, the strategic behavior is always important in that. The starting point bias, the sequence effect when you have when you are valuing different uh, goods in one survey, information bias. So if you give in the scenario a lot of information or little information, you will have most likely differences in willingness to pay. Now, when we use willingness to pay, willingness to accept. So with continuing evaluation, you can use both. The way is how you put that. So if you have an increase of an environmental good, uh, so a benefit, for example, we can ask, what is the maximum willingness to pay to have that increase or to have that benefit? Or we can ask exactly the same in another way. What is the minimum willingness to accept to forego that increase? So it's basically exactly the same. You can go for willingness to pay or willingness to set. However, you have to be careful with the disparity between willingness to set and willingness to pay. When you have a decrease of an environmental good, for example, air pollution that we were talking uh, in the energy generation, we can ask what is the maximum willingness to pay to prevent or to avoid the reduction, to avoid the air pollution, or what is the minimum willingness to accept that you will tolerate to uh, that that you will uh, need to tolerate that so what is the compensation people living around a wind farm needs to tolerate the wind farm there or what is the maximum willingness to pay to prevent the wind farms to be built there so you can go for both and this will be the same for uh, choice experiments. Okay, before I go to choice experiment, any question about continuing evaluation? Uh, hi, Claudia. There is one student. Uh, okay. Give me a message. Uh, okay. Uh, in her message, she said like, hello, Dr. Claudia. The presentation is very good and quite interesting about market goods and non-market goods. I want to ask about externality. Can this COVID-19 be said to be a positive externality? Because seeing the impact on the environment is quite good. It, uh, and it means that this contingent valuation method or CPM is more about measuring the benefits of something that cannot be measured. All right, uh, doctor, thank you. Okay, can you repeat please uh, what, what is externality she's mentioning? Okay, so she uh, she would like to make sure where the COVID-19 can be said ah. to be a positive externality because uh, she feel that the impact on the environment is quite good. Okay, um, yes, actually, uh, that is something that we have seen a lot uh, with um, the pandemic, that the... Um, the impact on the environment in several places have been quite positive, especially in species. Uh, there is a regeneration. We have seen increase of the number of dolphins, of whales, and also um, uh, some other recreational areas that have, have uh, been benefited 
So yes, we could see that as an externality, as a positive externality, and we can value uh, that. And now it's a bit tricky the way to value because this is not an activity, it's, a, it's just something you know that happened. Uh, in, in terms of uh, a virus, it's a bit uh, probably tricky the way how we put that, but um, but uh, we could always use one of these approaches. How much are you willing um, to pay, for example, to avoid this uh, the loss of these uh, biodiversity gains uh, due to going to a normal life? So, uh, um, so yes, uh, they, it is an externality and it can be valued using continued evaluation in, in this way. So, um, yeah, I hope that answers. If there is any other question, happy to have them. Yes, Professor, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm a student at International Finance, so probably my question will be connected to the uh, finance issue. Is it possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so uh, to be honest, I'm preparing for my thesis. So my thesis about the finance, yeah, uh, the, the, the sustainable finance. So for example, I would like to a questionnaire, why, uh, some of the corporate, for example, to know the 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 the, the you know the 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 willingness to pay uh, a, a corporate in order to decrease the number of uh, you know uh, environment the number of you know uh, such as in 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 order to reduction for example to the reduction the uh, the, the, uh, the 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 environmental goods, for example, is it possible to use the you know methodology uh, willingness to pay or willing, willingness to uh, to accept uh, in 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 my research? Sure, sure, it is. I mean, is uh, if it is environmental good. Now you need to be very specific in what is the good you are valuing. Okay, yeah. you cannot just say environmental goods because yeah. then. It too, too, too big, too broad. So uh, your value could be anything, okay? Yeah, because yeah, because as, as far as I know, today's issue, it will be related to the climate finance, for example, or, you know, mm -hmm. sustainable finance or social responsible uh, finance and et cetera, et cetera. So I think this uh, topic will be interesting. So that's why I uh, provided this question to know to know more about the this this concept uh, yeah to be to be honest also i graduate from from the the, the the department of economics but now this i mean now i concerning i'm concerning to the financial issue uh, yeah no yeah. this is something that you can use and you can uh, if i have the time i'm going to show how to do cost benefit analysis with the use yeah. of these values so definitely i mean it, that that's something that uh, is designed for that to calculate uh, the values of environmental goods. So uh, yeah, through willingness so to pay or willingness to sell. Thank you so much for your uh, comments. I appreciate it. No, you're welcome. Okay, so let me uh, go to the next uh, methodology, which is um, the choice experiment. So the choice experiment is another stated preferred methodology that has its origin in the marketing and transport literature, and is also based on surveys. For this method, uh, we have that the base is the premise that individuals derive the utility of the, from characteristic of the good, instead from the good itself. When we were talking about a uh, continuum evaluation, we had the good as a whole. Uh, in this case, we have, and we are focusing on characteristics of the good. Therefore, the good will be described in terms of attributes or characteristics and the levels of these attributes. So respondent will be given a hypothetical setting 
And then there will be the hypothetical setting, setting is the same as in continuum evaluation. And then they will be uh, presented with repeated choice tasks that will consist on two or more alternatives. I'm going to show you examples in a second. Each alternative is described by a number of attributes and levels. So the respondent had asked to choose one, just one of those alternatives, the preferred alternative. And in doing so, they are revealing their preferences. They are making trade-offs uh, between them. For example, this is a choice uh, set we uh, use for valuing externalities of wind power. So what you see here are the attributes or the characteristics. So our characteristics were, um, were the um, externalities. So the location, the uh, impacts on birds, uh, the impact on the area covered, and always we need to introduce the price if we want to get uh, monetary values. So in this case, we have just two projects. Uh, for example, and people have to make decisions. For example, project A is located, the wind farm is located on mountains while in the other is in the coast. The B uh, hoards 3% of birds, but the A just 1%. But the A covers a larger amount of uh, land and the B is lower. The project B, is more expensive than the A. So you make a decision here. So you make this trade-off. It's not easy, obviously, because you have to say like, okay, what I would, would I prefer in the cost? Would, would I prefer longer space or hurt less uh, or more um, birds? Or what do you want to pay more or less? So you have to make this trade-off and choose just one of them. So you are showing your, your uh, preferences. Let's see another example. This is an example for, for energy, renewable energy in Scotland. Basically the same. The externalities are on landscape, wildlife, air pollution, employment, and the price of electricity as we had before. And then we have two plants in here and an either. So when we have an either or not, in the previous one we didn't, and the thing is, it didn't have an either option because um, there, there was uh, for sure the wind farm to be built in the country. While in uh, when this other uh, was done, there was the option of just not building wind farms and go for a thermoelectric, for example. And then in here you get the so you get the characteristics in here, and then you get the different levels in this other part. And finally, you can have really very complex choice experiments like this. I'm not going to read it, but uh, I would really discourage you to do things because the complexity of this can really completely vanish your evaluation. But it is possible. And this is for climate change. So for the choice experiment, you need, I mean, all these values you use here, it's not just out of your imagination or uh, you put in them. It, they are created through an experimental design theory. Uh, and in general, the choice experiment include a monetary attribute, the price that I show you, which will enable you to calculate marginal willingness to pay. So in continuum evaluation, you have total willingness to pay, while in choice experiment, you have marginal willingness to pay. And it's also possible to infer marginal rate of substitutions with a choice experiment, which we cannot do in a continuum evaluation. So uh, the model is based on Lancaster uh, 66, in which individuals derive the utility from the characteristic of the good. And uh, it's linked as well as in the continuum evaluation to the random utility model. Uh, for, of McFadden. So exactly the same as before, where the utility is uh, formed but by an observable element and the stochastic uh, element that is non-unobservable. 
So um, the individual then can choose between N alternatives, the, pref uh, the one the individual prefer, and the assumptions are the alternative um, is consumed in a given quantity. Only one alternative can be chosen, and uh, there is a weak complementarity, which means that the attribute of non-select alternative will not affect the utility. So only the uh, select alternative. And this is basically the same we had uh, for continuum evaluation. So the utility function, but now instead of, of having uh, situation zero and one, we have alternative A and alternative J, two alternatives. And the individual will choose the alternative I if and only if the utility uh, they get from that is larger than the utility that they get from J. So uh, in this way, we introduce the stochastic. Because we have this stochastic term, again, we uh, have to uh, solve this with probabilities, okay? So we need then to decide on the functional form of the utility function and make some assumptions on the distribution of the error term. Uh, the common assumption is that they enter in an additive term and is uh, the utility function is linear in attributes, just to make things uh, easier. So, the main challenge of all of this is how we integrate then the values um, and the nature and its value in everyday decision. Because until now, what you will get from choice experiment, from continuum evaluation or the other techniques are values of environmental good. So the question is how we integrate those values in everyday decisions. We generally have the economic activities. This, the economic activities produce outcomes. For example, tourists produce certain outcomes, some pollution, for example, that will change, make changes in the ecosystem services. So we need to use that information to in, and include the preferences and the values. Here is where you, uh, with, when this has a role the introduction of those values that will generate the information to policy makers and to institution. So they can create the uh, policy instrument and incentives that will impact again the economic activity. So that is how we really get uh, the important role of uh, this. And uh, before I continue, Romy, I know we are um, we are almost on the time. How, how much we have left? I think it's five minutes. Okay, so mm -hmm. then I am, I won't have the time to to go through the specific examples, uh, but but I would like to mention them quite quickly. Just let me know, uh, Romy, please, when time is over. So I just jump to the just one minute early, I jump to the conclusions, okay? Okay, sure. So um, a couple of examples I have in the slides, which you will get after the presentation, is the conservation of giant tortoises in Galapagos Island and the evaluation of externality from generation, energy generation, renewables. Very quick, and I am sorry uh, for, uh, for uh, this, but uh, this is, uh, that. that do you go to the theory? We did a, a work on uh, the economic valuation of giant store twice in the Galapagos Island, which is uh, um, the problem in there was that the conservation was threatened by introduction of uh, invasive species that were increased by the tourist activity. And uh, then it was the introduction of rodents that, uh, that with the impact of increased diseases, break of eggs uh, of um, uh, the tortoise and the newborns. So the tortoises were reducing. So we apply a continued evaluation to value the uh, conservation programs or uh, the impacts of these uh, activities. So we use the continued evaluation me method 
and we estimate uh, after collecting the data profit models and we get the willingness to pay from people so what you do with this information is the important thing so you basically do the aggregation you aggregate by the uh, population and you calculate the present value using the social discount rate of the country so uh, and we estimated that to be 83 million of US dollar. So that is the first thing. Aggregate cost, uh, the, uh, calculate the present value, and you have the aggregate value of the resource. And so you can introduce that information into cost benefit analysis. So we have the cost of, we have two options here, two policies. So we have the cost of these uh, policies and we had the willingness to pay of people. So we could do a cost benefit analysis and say that, okay, we can uh, go for uh, the policy of, uh, of uh, um, poison uh, to, to certain species to, rec no, sorry, to recover the tortoises in an habitable uh, island, but we can only can go for a partial uh, a partial cover of the second option. So um, I'm gonna uh, skip the renewable energy uh, example, which is exactly the same. We calculate the willingness to pay for renewable energy uh, sources instead of fossil fuels or large dams. And then we aggregate that uh, and uh, we calculate the uh, the present value using the social discount rate and a period of 20 years. So we got the cost of the different projects. So we have different scenarios, different projects. We got the cost of them. So what we did, uh, then we took the willingness to pay. We had as the value of externalities and we add them to the cost. So we could uh, then uh, uh, have the policy advice because we found that the renewables that were much more expensive, if you consider the externality cost, we, which we did through valuation, then they become uh, competitive. So uh, in, in the base of that, how inform uh, policy? We can inform policy by uh, doing rankings, by using it in cost benefit analysis to make more inf and better informed decisions. And finally, with the design of a policy instrument. For example, now you have the value. You can decide that tax I was talking before. You know the value, which is indicative, and you can go and decide that tax or the subsidy or any other. Uh, so final remarks on this is when, if you want to do continuing valuation, uh, so, sorry, any valuation that is gonna be used in policy, involve authorities in the design, always communicate with them. It is very important to have a multidisciplinary approach and use the values. I always see a lot of valuation, um, a, a valuation exercise in which you have just uh, the, the value. And so what? Use the value. Don't just calculate the value, okay? And uh, um, yes, I'm gonna, something to take into account is that the values are illustrative and indicative. You always need to minimize the uh, biases and the values reflect a relative important, importance. So, uh, so use them to inform again. So that is for uh, today. So yeah, welcome any other questions? Hi, any question? Any question so far? I think that's quite interesting. Like we have three questions so far, Claudia. Yeah. 
even though two of them are a bit shy, so they decided to uh, send me a personal message to ask to you. <laughs> yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, in any case, I mean, if uh, there is any further question arising uh, later on, uh, mm -hmm. you can always contact me. There is my, my email contact, mm -hmm. uh, my email address. So uh, it's just sending me uh, an email in case there is any, any further questions. Mm -hmm. OK, since I think the time is up, thank you very much. Uh, for uh, sharing uh, about uh, market versus not market goods. Like, I hope uh, uh, we really appreciate, uh, uh, we are really grateful that uh, you are able to provide, uh, provide your precious time to share this uh, material. And uh, thank you very much as well for all the participants. Mm, to be here, like, uh, hope you uh, enjoy the session and benefit uh, from the, and can benefit from the session. Like, uh, I think uh, that's all for our uh, case lecture series today. And we are happy to have you here, Claudia, and uh, uh, we hope that uh, we're still able to see you in another guest lecture uh, series uh, next year, I guess. <laughs> sure. in the Thank afternoon. you very much, uh, Romy, and also all the people who came. And, um, and well, yes, hopefully we, we see <laughs> any other time again. OK, so please don't forget to send the slides, Claudia, because some of okay. them request the slides since they are really interested to learn more from you. Sure, no problem. I'm going to send you the slides right after, okay. after this, OK? OK, so okay, so I guess that's all for uh, the session. OK, so thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, Claudia. Cheers. See you. Cheers. See you, Claudia. See you. Mm -hmm.